have, as Christians, we have different faith in difficulties. Amen? Well, what that means is that we cope differently than how the world copes with problems. Or we should be able to cope differently than the world coping with problems. That we take joy in the trial because God is so good at using the hurt. God is so good at using the hurt, using the pain really for our gain. And this week we're going to see how we have different cultural values than the world around us. That we as Christians, we should have different cultural values than the world around us. Uh, Theirs is an earthly, horizontal man culture. Ours, though, is a vertically, heavenward, heavenly culture. A God-focused culture. It should be. Amen? Amen. Okay. So that's what we're going to talk about this morning. That ours, even though we live on this earthly earthly plane... We have a heavenly, vertical, God-shaped culture. And that's what we're going to reveal in 1 Peter. And we're going to be there in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 13. So prepare your hearts and minds for action and exercise self-control. Put all your hope in the gracious salvation that will come to you when Jesus Christ is revealed to the world. So you must live as God's obedient children. Don't slip back into your old ways of living to satisfy your own desires. You didn't know any better then, but now you must be holy in everything you do, just as God who chose you is holy. For the scriptures say, you must be holy because I am holy. And remember that the heavenly Father to whom you pray has no favorites. He will judge or reward you according to what you do. So you must live in reverent fear of Him during your time here as temporary residents. Did you hear me? Temporary residents. Residence. What that means, in other words, is this home, this world, is not your home. You have a different home. You just, you just passing through. You have a higher calling. God is calling you and I, church, to be different. And the problem, I think, with so many of us, uh, Christians even, so many of us in our culture today, the biggest obstacle we face in fully knowing Christ and fully being devoted to Christ is our desire, church. To fit in. Our desire to look just like everybody else looks. And and our desire to to be like everyone else. And I I think the biggest obstacle for so many is, especially being faithful to God and the call to be different, is longing to look like everyone else. And some of you might say, that's not me. That's not me. I, I don't desire that. Well, but truthfully, I think a lot of times we go, man, I wish I had what that person has. Even if it's their joy, even if it's their hope, even if it's their, what they, how they carry themselves into work or how they carry themselves into life. And we have this problem, it's a cultural problem of wanting to look like the rest of the world and wanting to be liked by them and to be accepted by them. But church, can I get witness that God did not call us to fit in? He called you to stand out. He called you to be different. To be above the fray, as the scripture says. He never said that we're to blend in to the things of this world. Actually, he said, you are not to be conformed to the patterns of this world, but to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That means you're not to look like them. You're to look like something else, and that's to look like Jesus Christ. Because we know that God's desire for us is that we become more and more like Jesus every day in every way. Amen. Amen. So why do we want to be normal anyway? That's a good question. Have you seen what normal looks like? I've always talked to you about this. Like if once we've come out of Adam, once we've come into Jesus, why would we want to go back into Adam? Because if you're in Adam, you're in the Adam's family. Who wants that? What, what's, what's normal in the world? I'll tell you what normal in the world is. It's broke. Right? Normal in the world is tension and bondage. Normal is divorce. Normal is sleepless nights. Normal is anxiety. Normal is depression. Normal is not like in the job. Normal is nothing like what we think normal is, is it? Man, I don't want no part of normal. How about you? I don't want normal. I don't want anything to do with normal. I want off the quote-unquote normal road. Jesus said there's this normal road. 
and it's broad and it's wide and there's a lot of people on this normal road. But he said there's this narrow road though with a small gate and very few are on that road. Let me tell you a story about when I was young. I was really young. I was in a daycare at this daycare called Rainbow Daycare. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Oh, some of y'all know this, okay. Uh, it was here in Lubbock. It no longer exists. I don't know why. Um, Christy, my wife, she went to that daycare. Apparently, we went to that daycare at the same time. Uh, she could have been one of the kids I was picking on because I thought she was cute. I mean, who knows, right? Small. I, there's a story. There's a point to the story. Y'all follow, amen? So... <laughs> I went to this, this daycare, Rainbow Daycare, and this was about the same time where the movie rent release of Short Circuit 2 was coming out. Anybody ever seen Short Circuit? Short Circuit 2? Only a couple of you? Johnny Five is alive. Y'all don't know what I'm talking about? Wow, I got an amen over here. I don't, that's weird. Um, but it's a good movie. If y'all haven't seen it, y'all need to go rent from the 80s Short Circuit. Uh, this is back in the day when you would actually go to the movie rental store. Right? There's a Hastings, there's a Blockbuster. You'd see the movie cover and you'd just pray that your movie was in one of the boxes behind the cover. Right? Amen. There was nothing worse than walking into a Blockbuster or a Hastings and you see your movie lined up the whole aisle and there wasn't one movie behind any one of those covers. Yep. Right? It's, it's wrong that some of y'all have no idea what I'm talking about. <laughs> they, y'all will never feel the pain that I'm talking about right now on this row. That's just wrong. But I'm at this daycare, and it's about that time in the day when my mom was supposed to be picking me up from daycare, but I'm a kid, and I don't know, and I don't care. And we're on the playground, and, and this snot bucket kid, he was a boy, not Christy, he, he called my mom a name. Do you remember this? She doesn't remember. She call, he called my mom a name on the playground. And you know what? I didn't like it. I didn't like it one bit. Uh, you can say whatever you want to about my sister, but don't you talk about my mom. <laughs> and I was mad about it. And, and, you know, like any, you know, testosterone-filled rage, something happened inside of me. And I got something that just dwelt up inside of me, and I chased that kid. And this, all of a sudden, this bad word formed in the back of my head. And I, I chased him down, and, I ta- and I'm talking like, Super Bowl tackled this kid to the ground like old football, not today's wimpy football, but old school football. And I tackled this kid and I threw him to the ground. He called my mom a name. So that word, I called him a name. And that word came from the back of my head. And I, I yelled it with some, so much force, so much anger, so much passion. Some of you are looking at me like, well, Pastor Trent, what was the word? What was it on, was it on the, the lower part of the profanity scale or was it on the higher part? I'm not going to tell you what the word was. But I yelled with such force and such anger and such hate in my heart. And right then, at that moment, I hear my mom yell, Trenton Paul. That's not my name, first of all. But when she got really mad, that's what she would yell. And I looked up and when our eyes met, I just started crying. I just boohooed all over this poor kid I'm laying on top of. Just crying, mama. And I went and gave her a hug and everything. Well, we're, we're driving back home and she looks back at me and she goes, now, can you tell me what that was all about? And, and, and why you said that? Because I'm sure my mom's thinking in the back of her head, it must have been really bad for my sweet, innocent boy to say what he said. <laughs> and... And I, I just remember, I looked up at her and I said, he called you a name. He called you a name. She goes, what, what, did, he, what did he call me? It must have been really bad. I said, Mom, he called you a snowblower. <laughs> <laughs> now, some of you are like, that's not so bad. But I didn't know what he meant by that. And apparently it was from the famous movie Short Circuit 2 where the robot calls out, your mama was a snowblower. See, Chris, is, he remembers this movie, right? <laughs> Apparently, the movie wasn't there when we went to the movie rental store that day. And I didn't know what the kid said, and I didn't know what he meant, but I knew he had ill intention in his heart. <laughs> Church, I'm glad you're laughing now, but at the moment, at the time, it was no laughing matter. At the time, and, and now, 30 years later, listen, it dawns on me that the same mouth 
that was designed by God to preach his glorious grace, to preach his good word, said that exact same thing to that poor kid on the playground that day. Man, that just that troubles my heart a little bit and said something in a manner that would be so displeasing to my God. And some of you would go, you know what, Trent? And you'd say with grace in your heart and you have all good intentions. Well, I would have done the same thing, right? And that's kind of the normal reaction, isn't it? But church, we are called to be different than normal. We're, we're not to look like the rest of the world. When, when someone calls your mama a name in the world, we're to look differently, amen? I know that's a silly example, but it's, it's, it's mine. It's one I have. And we should have a different kind of calling on us. The good news is, church, for, for the longest time, I've trained my brain, I've trained myself not to outwardly say those words anymore. But the problem is, for the longest time, I didn't stop thinking them. I didn't stop thinking them. Uh, I, I, I still had them there, and they still welled up inside of me. And just because the outward behavior changed didn't mean the inner source had been transformed yet by the grace of Jesus. It hadn't been transformed yet by his grace. And so I want us to look at this again, what Peter is talking about and who remember who he's talking to. For those of you that weren't here last week, he's talking to a persecuted bunch of Christians. And this persecuted bunch of Christians, they were being tortured, burned to death, eaten alive by animals. They were going through a horrible experience in their time. It's not a persecution that I think any of us are having to endure today. I don't think. Amen. So that's what they're going through. And this is Peter telling them how to be different than this culture that's hating on them. Okay. Let's look at what he says again at 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 14. He says this. So you must live as God's obedient children. Don't slip back to your old ways of living to satisfy your own desires. You didn't know any better then. Basically saying you, there was a time that you didn't know any better. But now, for those of you who are in Jesus, you know better now. You didn't know any better way back when, but you know better today. Verse 15, but now you must be holy in everything you do. He didn't say you must be holy only when you're in church. He didn't say you must be holy only when you're not on Facebook. <laughs> you, must, you must be holy. And I could have example upon example. He said, you must be holy in everything you do. Don't slip back in your old ways of living to satisfy your own desires. You didn't know better than this. You, but now you must be holy in everything you do. Just as God who chose you is holy. For the scriptures say you must be holy. Why? Because I am holy. Why be holy? Not to attain more of God's love. Well, God, I got to be more holy so you'll love me more. No. No, he didn't say that. Well, I got to be holy so I can earn more from God. So, so if I'm more holy, he'll do more for me. No, I didn't say that. The reason it said you must be holy is because he is holy. Because he's holy, therefore, in Jesus, I am holy. I'm going to teach you that this morning. Notice what it doesn't say also. It doesn't say what so many people want to believe that it does. It doesn't say... Be happy in all you do, for I am happy. So you are called to be happy. You know, it didn't say that, did it? Did you notice that? Yeah, because for so many people, they believe that God's highest calling and highest purpose for their life is their happiness. My highest calling is my happiness, right, God? That's your highest calling. Church, if you're taking notes, I want you to write this down. Happiness is not your highest calling. God's holiness should be a higher priority than your happiness. God's holiness should be a higher priority than your happiness. Again, if you're taking notes, let me put it this way. God's highest calling for Christians is not their happiness. His highest calling is their holiness. He has called us to be different, to be set apart, to be holy. See, there's a problem with the theology of happiness, church. The problem with the theology of happiness, in other words, what God wants for me above all else is my happiness, is, is we have this, this personal justification that takes place, right? What, what do I mean by that? I mean that if we believe truly that God's highest calling in our life is our happiness, 
then we will be allowed to do certain things that would otherwise be unwise or wrong. Well, if God really wants me happy above all things, then, you know, I can really, I can do this. It's okay. You know, Jesus died for that, so I, I can do that because God really, he loves me. He, he loves me, and he wants me happy above all else. See, the problem with that theology is personal justification. We start to justify things for happiness, and that's not God's highest calling for you. If God wants me happy, then, and I'm not happy in my, my, my marriage, and by all means, I can walk out the door, right? Well, I know we're in covenant, but I'm not happy. And church, I could use examples upon examples upon examples, but what it does is it empowers us to personally justify something that would otherwise be wrong in our lives when we believe that above all else, God's desire is for us to be happy. With that train of thought, then that means that discomfort. And listen, in, in the kingdom of God, I have felt a lot of discomfort before. But sometimes my most uncomfortable moments are when my faith is stretched the most and I've found a renewed faith, a stronger faith in God in my being uncomfortable. Amen? But if we are under the theology of happiness, that God wants my happiness above all things, then this discomfort and, and, and delay, there's a lot of delay in the kingdom of God. And risk and inconvenience, well, none of that could possibly be God's will. And church, all of a sudden what starts to happen is, is we, without even knowing it, we begin to worship false gods, false idols, the idol of comfort, the idols of money and pleasure and things. Well, if God's, God's going to give me what I want because... Because the scripture says, if I, if I love God and I'm called, to his per, uh, called according to his purpose, then he'll give me what I want. Well, God, God loves me and, 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 and God wants me to be happy. Church, can I get a witness that God does not exist to serve us? Amen. But we exist solely to serve God the Almighty. Amen. We're here to serve him. That's a different perspective than, than the world at large, church. We are here to serve Him. He has called us to be holy because He is holy. What does that word holy mean? I'm going to show you. It comes from the Greek word. That Greek word is hagios. It means to be different, to be set apart, to be pure. Holy means to be pure, set apart, and different. That's what God is calling us to do not conform to the patterns of this world. Let me say this. And this isn't for, for you to take your finger. Everyone take your finger. This isn't for you to take your finger and point anywhere else but here. No, not me. This is your heart. Okay? This is for self-reflection. Okay? What I'm about to say here is for you. It's not for anybody else in this room. It's not for ammunition on your spouse. It's not for ammunition for anybody in the workplace. It's for you. Amen? Amen. Okay. If you look, church, listen, if you look just like the world, then you're not really being led by Lord Jesus Amen. day to day. You're, not, you're really not. Amen. Because truthfully, if Jesus is Lord of your life, if he's Lord, if he really is master, if he really is Lord, then you're going to do what he says. And you're going to say what he, what, what he does. Amen? I mean, I mean, think about Jesus himself. Jesus said there's... I didn't say one thing apart from what the Father told me to say. I didn't do anything unless the, the Father told me to do it. Amen. So if we're really following Lord Jesus, then we're going to look differently than the world. And I'm not saying this for your condemnation. I'm saying this for your freedom. Okay, this is truth. This will set you free. Amen. If you, if you look just like the world, then church... We're going to have to change some things. You're not really following God's divine call on your life to be different. When you think about Joshua and, and, and his statement that he made to, to God Almighty, think, remember what he said. He said, God, as for me and my family, we will serve the Lord. But remember the context in which he said it. He said it in the context of, God, we will not serve today's culture. Not going to do it. God, I'm not going to serve the idols of today's culture. I'm going to serve you and you alone. Amen. 
And that's, that's the heart in which he was saying it. And a lot of times in church even, we'll say God will serve you. As for me and my family, we're going to serve the Lord with lip service, but our heart is far from him. It's our actions and it's what we do day in and day out that shows and proves are we, are we following Lord Jesus day to day or are we not? Okay? If we want to be different, and better yet, if we want our kids or our grandkids to be different and to find their divine callings to be different, then that means that we're going to have to choose the things that are in our life today that look just like the world, and we're going to have to make a change. Amen. We're going to have to deliberately be different. Amen. I want to show you this, okay? And I'm going to make this blanket statement, and I, man, I'm not picking on anybody this morning. Don't go, oh, he's talking about me. Okay, not picking on anybody this morning. I'm not going to, I'm just going to state an observation and hopefully no one gets too offended. Y'all ready? And say, I love my precious little pastor. Y'all didn't, didn't want to say it this time, I know. But listen, listen, Halloween's coming up this week, okay? Halloween's coming up this week and it's an easy one. It's just an easy one to pick on. It's an easy one to look at and say, for, as for me and my family, do we look just like the world on this day, or do we look different? Okay. Let, let me make it easier on everybody, okay? No one like that. Let me make it easier, okay? Christmas coming up in just a couple of months. Two short months. Oh, saw some people grab their hearts. Oh, two months. Maybe you need to hear this, okay? On that day or in that season, do we and our families look just like the world? Or do we look different? Right? Day to day, do we look just like the world or do we, do, do we look different? All this is to say is if we want to be different, if we want to raise different kids, I'm, I'm not ashamed to say, oh, my kid's different. I want our kids to be different. And at some point in our life, then that means that we need to choose to be deliberately different. Amen. If, if, if we're not different in any way, then how in the world can we expect our children to see the value in following Christ? Amen. If we're not different in any way, then how can we expect our children to have any tolerance to being set apart or different? Okay, God is calling us to be holy in all we do. That verse, again, let me, let me read it again. That verse, 1 Peter 1, 14. You must live as God's obedient children. Don't slip back into your old ways of living to satisfy your own desires. I love the way that Peter says this. Because there's no one better in the Bible to explain this than Peter. Because he slipped. Can I get a witness? He tripped. He slipped. Amen. He's walking on water and then he slipped. That's what he did. <laughs> Amen. So Peter knows what he's talking about here. And he says, hey, listen, don't slip back. And I love the way he's saying that here. Because how many know you can slip into trouble, but very rarely have I ever heard that you slip into righteousness. Amen. You hear it all the time. People say it all the time. Oh, pastor, pastor, I, I just, I slipped. I fell. I tripped into sin. I fell into trouble. Right. But I've never heard anyone come up to me and say, oh, I just, I don't know what happened. I just, I just slipped into righteousness. I'm, I'm, I'm righteous. Don't know how it happened. <laughs> right? Amen. You never see that. You never hear that. And, and, and it doesn't happen that way. Why? Because we have this enemy who will cause us to slip up, trip up, and fall. And, and he's the father of lies. And he's so subtle about it. Don't think that he's so arrogant that he's not subtle. Right? Now, we, we give him too much credit, I think. I th he's not going to come up to you and say, could you be a Satan worshiper today? Well, you're not supposed to say yes, Chantel. My goodness, he's not going to be that way. Let's pray for this woman. My goodness. But he doesn't do that. Okay? He's subtle about it. He's the father of lies. What, what is he doing? He's doing this. He's saying, hey, why don't you look around? Why don't you look horizontal for a second? Why don't you look around? Why don't you see what everybody else is doing? How about you look at the cultural norm? Man, do you really want to speak out against that? You could be ridiculed for what you're saying. And what you're saying, that could be hate. You know, they're showing a lot of love here and you're just, you're just spewing a bunch of hate. Why don't you look horizontal? Don't you want to fit in? 
Don't you want them to like you? Do you see what I'm saying, church? It's very cunning. It's very subtle. Well, pastor, I do look around. I'm a whole lot better than a whole lot of people. I'm a whole lot, of be- I'm a whole lot better than them. Church, that's still a trick. That's, that's a trick of the devil. Why? Because them are not the standard. They are horizontal, earthly, and man-focused. The standard is vertical, heavenly, and God-focused. They are not the standard. Listen, church, a lot of people are not the standard. God calls us to be, as Christians, different, set apart, hagios, holy, holy. Let's continue to read what Peter's saying to the same group of persecuted Christians. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18, he says this. And remember, as he ends in verse 17, you, temporary residents, for you know that God paid a ransom. I don't know if many people know this, but when you think about a kidnapping, man, we, we not, not some people who are really different in here, but most of us in here have watched secular movies. And we know what a ransom is, right? A kidnapping takes place, and the, and the kid is snatched away, and, and the, the thief, the enemy, they call the good guy, and they say, hey, we have your kid. You can have your kid back, but he has, to, he has to be ransomed. And so there's this great amount of value or money that's placed to get the kid back. Y'all know that, right? That's, that makes for a good plot, a good storyline. Jesus has done something for us in the kingdom of God. And we see here that it says, for you know that God has paid a ransom. To save you from the empty life you inherited from your ancestors. That's that empty life I was talking about in Adam. Just like the rest of the world. You've been ransomed from that. See, Satan stole you away from God. But Jesus has ransomed you back, church. And it was not paid with mere gold or silver, which lose their value. How were you bought back? How were you ransomed back? It was by the precious blood of Christ, the sinless, spotless Lamb of God. Church, that should make us shout. That should make us excited. That's how you were purchased. That's how you were bought back. He goes on to say, God chose him, Jesus, as your ransom long before the world began. But now in these last days, he's been revealed for your sake through Christ. I'm going to say it again. Through Christ, you have come to trust in God and you have placed your faith and hope in God because he ransomed Christ or he raised Christ from the dead and gave him, Jesus, great glory. Amen. There's a lot here, but I I want to break it apart for you real quick. It's real simple. It's through Christ. Amen. It's through Christ. I can't say it any, any simpler. It's through Christ. God has called us as Christians to be different, to be set apart. How? It's through Christ. If you don't get anything else today, I hope you get this. Here at Connect, our passion is that you discover more about who you are in Jesus every time you come. Amen. That's our hope. That's our passion. We want you to discover more about who you are in Jesus every time you come. Here it is this morning. Living holy is not the pathway to knowing Jesus. Knowing Jesus is the pathway to living holy. We need to write that down. We need to inscribe it on our our hearts and the tablets of our mind. Because listen, a lot of people are trying to change the outside to get to Jesus. And Jesus said, you get to me, it's going to change everything on the outside. Knowing Jesus, knowing Christ is the pathway to living holy. Holy. When we get to know him more, it's not that I have to do this thing that I really don't want to do, and I, I can't do this thing that was a whole lot of fun back then. No, it's, it's something has changed. My heart, there's a new heart in me on the inside, and it's changed. Instead of, oh, I don't want to do that thing that Christians do, it's, it's like I don't want to do anything now that's displeasing to my Father, my God. It's a change from the inside out. I want to live a life that brings God glory. And I don't care what everybody else says. I don't care if they laugh. I don't care if they criticize. I don't care if it's different. I'm living for an audience of one because of what Jesus did. And because of, of, because of what he did, I'm different now. And I'm proud to be different. I'm not ashamed to confess that I'm different because of he, who he is. Church, don't miss this. Listen, don't miss this. I'm not talking about behavioral modification, self-help. That's not what I'm talking about. 
I'm talking about inward spiritual transformation from the inside out. It's not, hey, look, 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 I don't cuss anymore. It's, hey, look, 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 I'm different from the inside. I'm different. I'm changed now. And out of the heart, church, the mouth speaks, says the Bible, says the scripture, says the word of God. Out of the heart, the mouth speaks, and I have a new heart now. And I don't say what I used to say. I know differently now. It's not that I'm trying so hard. It's because my roots are going deeper. It's because I'm, I'm closer to Jesus now than I was. Because daily I'm seeking Him in His presence. I'm following His word. And I'm not trying to stop do those things. But from the inside, He's making me more and more and more and more like Jesus. Amen. Amen. I think you're getting, I see some bobs. I love when I get a bite. I love to fish. Amen. And because I'm becoming more like Christ, not naturally, but supernaturally, it's by His power, by His power, by His grace that I'm starting to live a life worthy of the calling to be called different. To be called different. Not out of obligation or try harder, but out of an inward spiritual transformation. Amen. Remember again who Peter was writing this to. A very persecuted group of Christians who were hurting. And he's saying, look, be different. But listen, if they were to be different, they faced certain death. If they were to be different, they didn't just face being ridiculed on Facebook. They faced impending death. And to be labeled different in that culture was something much different for them than it is for us today. They lived boldly. I think we can live just as bold, if not more so. See, church, we live in a backwards world. We really do. We live in a backwards world. It's cultural values. It's earthly, horizontal, man-made values are different than our values. Different than the cultural values of the kingdom of heaven. And I'm challenging every single one of us in here this morning to snuggle up a little closer to Jesus every day. Amen. Snuggle up closer to Lord Jesus every day and courageously defend our heavenly culture. Defend our heavenly culture. I don't care what people think or say. I'm going to be different. I'm going to be different no matter the cost. I'm going to end with this. David, will, will, you, will you guys, Chris, Katie, Caitlin, will y'all go ahead and come on up here real quick. Uh, I wish I had more time to properly set this up, but I'm going I'm to end with this. Here's the short of it. Do y'all remember uh, Joseph, the, the coat of many colors, Joseph? Not Mary and jo okay. I'm going I'm to ask again. Do y'all remember Joseph, the coat of many colors, Joseph? Not Mary and Joseph, Joseph, but Joseph, coat of many colors. Yeah. Okay. You remember what happened to him? You might, let me let me kind of give you a little backstory. He was highly favored by his father. His father gave him the the coat of extraordinary, the coat of many colors. Back then, to get that many colors was a big deal. But but he was one of many sons, and so the the sons, the boys, they didn't like that Joseph was so favored by his father. They really didn't enjoy that very much. Okay. And he was also a dreamer. He'd, he'd been given gifts from God and he, he would just relate what these dreams were. And sometimes, you know, it's good to keep your mouth shut. Joseph never realized that. And so he'd tell his brothers the dreams that God gave him. He's like, you know, I had a dream the other day and it was, it was of all these other stalks in the field bowing down before this one stalk. And I realized that it was really God saying that all of you brothers will bow down before me one day. How many know a sibling doesn't want to hear that? <laughs> Amen. He even said it one time to his mom and his dad about the sun and the moon bowing down and, and how it really was all of them would bow down before him one day. And his dad's like, boy, I think that something's wrong with you right now. I'm not going to bow down to you. It, are you Okay. This is real. This is, this is like ragu, baby. It's in there. And, and so Joseph, the coat of many colors, Joseph, the coat of many colors, he says something one day and his brothers get fed up and they, they take him and they throw him and they sell him into slavery. They throw him in a pit and they sell him into slavery. They take his coat and they put blood on it and they go back to the father and say, hey, he was eaten by animals. Sorry, dad. <laughs> Oops. All right. And, and poor Joseph gets sold into, sold into slavery. So, so you think, oh my goodness, what has happened to this highly favored son? And he's sold into this horrible, wretched world. And it sounds really familiar. If you think about us, we are highly favored by God, church. Amen. And 
you know, the devil has sold us a, a bill of lies and we have been sold into a horrible lifestyle. But no matter what happened to Joseph, we know how the story went. God still divinely directed his path, did he not? We see that Joseph becomes second, the second most powerful man in all of the world. Second only to Pharaoh. We see that Joseph, he saved all of Egypt from famine. He saved his own family as they came looking for help. He saved them from starvation. They did end up bowing to Joseph. And Joseph ended up giving them land, the land of Goshen. So they had a land now. And now that's where we see the 12 tribes of Israel come out of the house of Israel, come out of Jacob's house. And they grow into a mighty nation because of what Joseph did. Wow, church, that's powerful. There's a point what I'm saying here. If we're not careful, we will take the things of God, the, the blessing of our Father, the glory of God, the riches of His grace, and we will take it off. We'll disrobe and we'll hang that stuff up in order so we can live and we can conform to the culture of today. That's what will happen. And when we hang the things of God up as opposed to proudly wearing the things of God, then we deliberately take away the power and the grace of God to work in our life like He wants to. Like He desires to, church. Listen, see, Joseph, he had the courage to wear his coat no matter the cost. He had his courage that he wasn't afraid to show up looking different in front of his peers. To show up looking different in front of those that didn't like him. To show up looking different, listen, even in his own family, he had the courage to show up wrapped and clothed in the favor of his father. Church, no need to be ashamed. Amen? Amen. Church, we need to commit to courageously wear the favor of our father, God, wherever we go and not be ashamed to bring the culture of the kingdom of heaven on earth as it is in heaven and not be ashamed Joseph was different because of the favor of his father and the gift of God church you and I are called to be different and have a different culture because of the gifts of God the love of God and the favor of God that's been, that's been bestowed upon us amen we have no need to be ashamed can I get a witness amen let's praise God for our divine covering amen Amen. Church, we did better this week. We didn't go. We didn't go over this week. I hope you were blessed this morning. I'm, I'm gonna. I'm gonna speak a blessing over you right now. Listen very closely, everybody. Everybody in here, listen. Stop what you're doing. Look up here. If ever in your life, if there's ever been a moment that you have confessed with your heart and with your mouth that Jesus is Lord then you have the covering of God on your life today. You are clothed with his righteousness. You are crowned with glory and honor. You are created and called to be different, and that's okay. When you go in the world this week, don't let the enemy trick you with the lies and the, and the deceitfulness and the cunning craftiness that he has. Don't look around this way, church, to determine your value, your worth, who you are. You look this way, amen? And you say, I'm a child of the king. And I don't care what you say. No matter the cost.